Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Road to Roll Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, joined Thursday, April 4th by Kyle Dvorak and Denny Carter, where we are going to break down the shocking out of nowhere, but not really Stefan Diggs trade to the Houston Texans on Tuesday. I'm going to cover it from every angle, and there are a lot of angles. It's a rare move that like has like true, genuine fallout on both sides. So we're going to break down the Steph Diggs move, and then we're going to talk about a topic near and dear to my heart, uh, me. My article <laughs> that I put out this week. I put out my annual coach rankings, and Kyle and Denny are going to probe me about it. And wrote a lot of words on a lot of coaches, and so it's so it is a really fun topic, and it's really fun after like several weeks of being inside my own head about it to actually like debate it with other people. Yeah, and like one of you makes a point where I secretly and say, "Oh yeah, man, I had him too low." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a problem. And I, I go and change it. No, I don't ever change the article after the fact, but we're going to talk about that. We're going to have some new, little few news items to get to, if we have time. Uh, but real quick, Denny made a very, 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 <laughs> very disturbing revelation right before we went to air. And that is he's becoming an Oakland, Sacramento, Las Vegas A's thought leader. You're watching I, A's games? I've watched three straight uh, against the uh, Boston Red Sox uh, team I know about. And uh, yeah, I, so I think I think what's going on here is a the the athletics play late at night on the west on the east coast. Okay, so oh, I I can true. turn them on after the kids are in bed. Um, I'm amazed by the lack of fans. Like like I'm in awe. It okay? is awe inspiring, and I mean, not I their mean, fault. They're they're jamming people into the front four or five rows, and they still can't do it. They still can't fill those row, row uh, those rows. And then and then thirdly, Pat, I think what's happening here on a subconscious level is I'm watching these these A's games and going, see, baseball's bad. See? <laughs> yes, I love this explanation. Oh, that was a great ending to this story. <laughs> yikes, yikes. No, you couldn't be more dead wrong. My we point don't... My, my point has been proved, proven. It's a, it's bad. I've watched the A's. Oh, we man. don't blame the A's fans who are getting the full Stan Kroenke. People outside St. Louis may or may not remember that before the Rams left town, they were made as bad as humanly possible in a stadium uh, that was as bad as humanly possible. And wouldn't you know it's fan support collapsed. Wow, shocker. Uh, Jeff Fisher, 7-9 again. Yeah, uh, amazing. Uh, you got opposing players tearing their ACLs on the sidelines because of how awful the, the surface is. Reggie Bush literally sued the city of St. Louis. Not oh a joke. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, not a joke. So the Oakland A's, I know this blueprint well. And it is such a shame. It, it is. Story, like a great baseball town, both from a past fan perspective and like producing major leaguers. Mm -hmm. um, it's a scandal. Oh, that's what's happening. I um I have an Oakland A's hat. I want everyone to know. I do too. Um, I got with the alt with the elephant on it. Do you have that, that one? No, I don't. Uh, the elephant's cool. I have the. I actually have the alternate yellow one with the green. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, a. the A's aesthetics. Let's just be honest. Second to absolute none. And probably They're great. Any of the four major sports, the most beautiful uniforms and hats you could possibly conjure yeah, up. That's exactly right. And I hope they keep them when they move to Vegas. I'm sure they won't. I'm sure they'll be silver. No, black. they will. I think they will. It's like the most valuable asset of the entire franchise, basically. Yeah. How, well, how clean. They uh, uh, coincidentally, my high school baseball team, uh, they played on last two years of high school, uh, had green and yellow as, as our jersey. So cool. enjoy. Denny, it. do you remember, or Kyle, which two previous towns has the athletics organization played in? No, hell no. No, no idea. You guys, you guys ever heard of a fella named Connie Mack? I have. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. No, Connie Mack. Connie He's an Mack, current guy. He, the legendary manager of the Philadelphia Athletics, managed for fifty years. Not a joke. Until he was in his late eighties, and apparently quite frequently slept in the dugout. And <laughs> then they left Philadelphia, were briefly in Kansas City, and now in Oakland, and then Las Vegas. So they are a very nomadic franchise, like their old fellow Oakland former brethren, the Raiders. They are addicted to moving. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I You'll be proud. Not I'm, I'm going to do some scouting today. Uh, someone I drafted on 33% of best ball teams, Jackson Holiday, was oh, wow. sent down to the minors despite Oof. immediately cranking a home run. And now his team dropped 25 runs they did. on my Charlotte Knights yesterday. They did. And so I'm going to see what this kid's all about because we need him to get called up for my best ball team. They've got Cooper, <laughs> who's his face in the name too. They have several like major league ready players on the team. It looks like one of the better AAA teams in recent memory. 
So, yeah, I mean, I've I've actually known a little bit about them because I find them fascinating. Uh, what the the or the, the Orioles, uh, you know, farm system, or whatever. And the Orioles have like I guess tanked and gotten a lot of good like they did. prospects for a while. They did. And now the Norfolk Tides are. Tides are a juggernaut and they've been this way for a few years because they had like I assume they had like Adley Rushman on this team or whatever they they two good guys on this team the Norfolk Tides could probably win 40 to 50 games out of 162 against the A's what yeah, I mean yeah. Denny they literally just dropped 25 runs <laughs> oh my goodness very yeah good. they, they have like I, like baseball is weird I don't get how they're having like minor league players who like I, they seem very good these minor they players do seem, good. Seem, seem MLB oh. ready this may show there's a little thing called capitalism and there's this thing they do called manipulating their service time. Uh, oh. I actually have, have read a little bit about this, but you'd probably explain it it's better. Quite unseemly, but we will leave that to our viewers to Google as we get into you know, what else is quite unseemly. Uh, Stefan Diggs, uh, always demanding trades. Now he's been traded yet again, folks. Steph Diggs, this time instead of Minnesota to Buffalo, it is Buffalo to Houston. The year, the decade, the era of the cryptic tweet is over for now. Uh, at least for now, Denny. Uh, we know more. Like as, as you pointed out, the second a single ball goes to Tank Dell or Nico Collins, <laughs> Steph Diggs, like, is he on his phone on the sideline? <laughs> right. And is he on the 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 platform X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, posting an emoji? Where I really really know what it's supposed to mean, but I do know what it means um, because of who it's coming from, and it clearly means he wants to trade. Right. Uh, Stephen Diggs yeah. is calling the police on Bobby Slowick for calling a screen a screen pass to Nico Collins. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. They cannot. They call the screen for Joe Mixon, and Steph Diggs has left the stadium. Kyle Dvorak. Well, Kyle wrote the the literal book on this. He put an article out here. Where, where do you think we should begin? Because I mean, the, so many storyline like are the Bills out of weapons? Are the Texans have the best skill core in the in the AFC now? Are the Texans like the biggest threat to the Chiefs in the AFC? Should we start with the Bills, Kyle, and just kind of like what is left behind? What does this mean? Like the Josh Allen Imperial phase and where it's going. Yeah, on, on the Bills side, they're not done. Like I, you'd be stunned if they don't add a first round receiver. I believe they picked 28, which in most classes, you're not thrilled with needing a receiver and having to pick four spots from the bottom of the first round. But if there's ever been a class where you're fine picking at 28, this would be the one. And they have some ammunition, obviously, partially via this trade to move up if, say, you know, Brian Thomas potentially makes it to, you know, 18, 19, 20. I don't know if he makes it there, but if he is on the board around 20, you're the Bills. You have to at least try to move up for a reasonable price. So I, I do think this is an incomplete picture, but there's not a ton left. Free agency is, you know, functionally over there. Like Tyler Boyd is, is still out there, right? But for the most part, we're pretty much wrapped on free agency. Boyd would also be very duplicative on this team. I think this speaks to a few things. One, their confidence in what they have in Dalton Kincaid, which is weird because like a, a good five game stretch last year when Dawson Knox was out, but it was good enough that I have some faith in his ability to run the underneath stuff on the offense and a lot of faith in the fantasy production of that, whether or not it actually works from a real life perspective. And we've seen this happen with the Chiefs specifically before, where when you have a superstar quarterback, I don't want to say the window is never open. The window is closed. The window is never closed. The window is like more close today than it was five days ago. But when you have Josh Allen, you can in any given Sunday go toe to toe with anyone. So you can take some long-term considerations on how you want to build your roster. Whereas like when you have Tua Tagovailoa, you should look at his rookie contract as a great window to try and get hot in the playoffs and make a run. Then you really have some hard decisions to make. Decisions never feel that hard when you have Josh Allen and you have Patrick Mahomes, even going down to Joe Burrow and Lamar Jackson. So I think people are going to overreact on how bad this is for the Bills. It's not great, but dude, you have Josh Allen. You're going to be okay. Are you going to be great? We'll see, but you'll be fine. I think you're absolutely right. People are going to overreact. I mean, as several people pointed out, including you do in your article, and it wasn't a hidden slump, but Steph Diggs wasn't exactly a difference maker down the stretch last year. Now you could, I'm sure there are unseen benefits to Steph Diggs being on the field where it's not just about his box score. It's about the attention he commands, but I mean, he for more than two thirds of the season, he was not the same Steph Diggs we came to know and love um, with Josh Allen. And so much of the focus is going to be on Dalton Kincaid and Denny. With Dalton Kincaid, one of the first things I thought was this guy is never going to be more positionless in his life. Like all <laughs> spring, I'm like, Kincaid, yeah, he's not even really a tight end, right? Uh, like this, this is the coaching staff, the media, definitely best ball drafters. He's more of a pass catch for he, he's like if Mike just he's like a deluxe Mike Jacecki when Jacecki was good. It's going to be amazing. Like this right. is trust me. He's like he's like Gronk if he were good. 
<laughs> you know, like yeah, it'll, it'll be it'll be like that. Yeah, he they'll, they'll even say he could play basketball if he wanted to. It's just he's up, he's everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're going to get a lot of hype and he's going to, his ADP is going to be at a premium, uh, Dalton Kincaid. And maybe, maybe for good reason. Um, I do think that probably his ADP will look different in like sharp leagues compared to more casual leagues where folks are like Dalton, who, what? I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, I'm more interested in Dalton Schultz. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, he should, he, there should be a lot of targets funneled his way. You know, one, one argument, uh, one pro digs argument that I, I find sort of fascinating uh, despite his drop off, Kyle did a good job of uh, of detailing, you know, how Stefan Diggs has dropped off, um, especially last season in his production profile. Uh, but uh, under Joe Brady, Pat's favorite offensive coordinator, um, you know, he uh, he was not featured. And that's not the first time that a wide receiver one is, was not featured under Joe Brady. We saw that with DJ Moore as well in Carolina, where he fell off the face of the earth statistically uh, when Joe Brady was calling plays. So maybe it's a Joe Brady thing. Um, I also have some numbers here if I could share with the folks about what that offense, what that Buffalo offense, just as a reminder. We talked about it during the regular season. That was, you know, generations ago. So let's let's just, uh, as a reminder, mm-hmm. under Joe Brady on this, in the second half of the season, um, Buffalo offense was below its expected dropback rate in seven of 10 games. Only the Falcons and the Steelers had a lower neutral pass rate than the Bills under Joe Brady. Oh. And the Bills passed on 47% of their plays uh, while leading under Brady. That's the, si- the sixth lowest rate in the league. So we're talking about what was a massively run first offense under Brady. So Dalton Kincaid will be the obvious one, maybe the less obvious one, but someone will be the subject of fierce debate as he has been for most of his career as Curtis Samuel, who you were talking. I couldn't stop. Couldn't help myself from thinking about his past connection with Joe Brady in Carolina, how he went off mm. under Joe Brady, I believe, in 2020 in Carolina. Mm-hmm. And Kyle, would it be fair? Is Curtis Samuel a wide receiver too? I mean, like these targets are going somewhere. And he was already the number two receiver, even though he's kind of uh, you want to talk about position this player. It, Curtis Samuel is not he's not really a receiver. He's not I think really he had the most back. carries in his career with uh yeah. in that Joe Brady season, I think. I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but he was like and sort of remains to this day the at least the capable of being positionless. They're adding a rookie, dude. I, I mean, I yeah. do do not see how you can functionally say as much as I say, like, oh, the window's always open with Josh Allen. I do not see how you can maximize any short or long-term window with Dalton Kincaid, who, like I said, I, he was okay last year he was like top 20 in yards per hour and he had a decent pff receiving grade but his usage was questionable at best and then curtis samuel who is a career does not play in two wide receiver sets only plays out of the slot and that overlaps with khalil shakir who in college and the nfl really only plays in the slot does not play unless they're in three wide they're adding someone, and I think that someone will earn enough targets to keep Curtis Samuel in still the wide receiver three mix, but uh, Curtis Samuel's wide receiver two feels like a myth we buy right now that in two months we are completely out on. Well, Samuel is the Bills receiver to draft, though, right? I would, Shakir, I would take him over Shakir. I would take him over Shakir. It's not Matt Collins. No. Yeah, so if it's after Samuel, is it clear-cut Shakir is the second guy to draft, or do you try to make an argument – for Matt Collins, or you try to get like really great, like KJ Hamler is back from his 19th injury. <laughs> Guys, I don't know if you knew about nah. this. Justin Shorter did some really good stuff in practice last year. Where? Oh, was he was he a draft pick, by the way? Justin Shorter. I think he was yeah, a day I believe, three pick. He was a day three pick, and I do not believe he took a snap last year. He did not. Uh so after Samuel, is it just easily Shakir? Uh, I, I think guess. so. I mean, I, I, I do feel like the, the sense in the community is that. Shakir is not good. Is that right, Kyle? I've, I've, I'm, I'm a little know. skeptical I think on that. It depends I, who you ask. I think it depends. I, li- I like him. I, I think every every time he got a full route share, he he was useful for fantasy. Yeah. The quote community runs extremely hot and cold. I feel like in every single Buffalo Bill. Uh, Gabe, yeah, Davis, I mean we we did that with Gabe Davis. We, we betrayed him. Yep. We did it with Isaiah McKenzie. Yeah, we yeah. have done it with Khalil Shakir. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe Josh Allen's just bad. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why these guys produce it ever. You're revisiting your 2020 take. <laughs> I'm dusting <laughs> off my 2019 Josh Allen yeah. take. But it was it was Dawson Knox all along. This is me on October eighth. Like we everyone knew it was gonna be Dawson Knox, right? I mean, he's an annoyance with for Kincaid for sure. Yes, yes. So we'll talk a lot more about this as the offseason goes. 
as the offseason goes on. On the Bills side, a pretty clear cut, Kyle or Denny, that Tank Dell's the biggest loser. We'll go Kyle first. He's kind of wrote about this. Do you think he's getting yanked off the field in two receiver sets for a very good reason because it makes perfect sense? Uh, is it just that easy to say, like, as much as we love Tank Dell, he's an undersized second-year pro coming off a major orthopedic injury who's now playing behind two extremely good wide receivers. That's high praise. I didn't think you liked Nico Collins that much. Extremely yeah, he, good. He's, he's bad, but it's fine. <laughs> Uh, I think it's most likely that he's the one, like you said, coming off serious injury, uh, size of a regular human. Like he'd fit in hanging out with us for the most part. He's probably still jacked, but at least his weight class would fit in with us. <laughs> uh, you know, he could probably still bench press me a few times over, to be fair. Not, not uh, probably. He, he could. He, he could. He definitely I'm could. not that big. He could bench press me a lot. Uh, so, But for NFL standards, tiny, tiny, tiny person playing with two extremely talented receivers. Interestingly, none of them are really even like, halftime slot players especially with digs in recent years nico collins always been an outside receiver and even tank dell looks obviously like stereotypical slot only size was winning as an outside receiver last year primarily that's almost all of what he played a vast majority of his snaps came there so i, I do think there is some sort of there's gonna be a rotation it's not just we have a three wide set and anytime we move out of it tank dell's the one who comes off the field but if you're taking bets, bet on the guy who's less than 170 pounds, who really doesn't have an archetype that he fits in the NFL to be the one who sees fewer snaps. And that's going to hurt, especially when they move into bigger sets in the red zone. That could cost him touchdowns. If last year they're only 20th in terms of 11 personnel pass rate, I think that comes up a lot. I think they probably push top five in that metric, but they have to for Tank Dell to really pay off at his ADP. And I think it's a likely bet but it's one that you have to win as a starting point. Just you need to be on the field that much as a starting point to pay off your ADP. I just thought of a really weird Tank Dell point before Denny jumps in. He was probably going to bulk up this offseason, but now he probably can't coming off this horrible leg injury. Maybe it's like, it could just be like a totally lost sophomore year for Tank Dell. <laughs> Denny, I don't know what you're going to say. Denny, make whatever point you're going to make and then take us through. Are we going to prioritize Nico Collins or Stefan Diggs in drafts? Right. So, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I, you know, sometimes we just, we take the an offense from the previous year and we copy and paste and put it into the current year and say, well, how are these players going to get there? How, how is Diggs and Collins and, and Tank Dell going to get there for fantasy? And sometimes that makes sense. But I, I, I do think that we have to remember circumstances like when Stefan Diggs went to Buffalo. And my initial reaction, I think a lot of people – in the industry had the reaction of, well, this it's is over. This is terrible. <laughs> this is the, this is the worst possible thing that could have happened to Stefan Diggs because the previous year, the bills were, were hugely run heavy because, you know, they're protecting an inexperienced Josh Allen. He's all over the place. Well, they, they open it up. They're much, you know, much more pass heavy in 2020 Diggs benefits with a monster target share and monster air yard share. And, you know, so they leaned into the past because, it, you know, it makes sense. It, it's, it almost goes without saying because they got a good receiver, right? And now the Texans seem to be going all in on the pass catchers. They have, oh, they already have two good ones. Now they get digs. They have Mixon. They have Dalton Schultz. I know Pat's feelings on Dalton Schultz, but uh, in, and, and uh, so I think that we can anticipate uh, maybe a spike or at least an increase in their passing in the way that they look at uh, at CJ Stroud as the center of the offense. I actually have some some numbers to kind of reinforce this. So we were frustrated last year because Bobby Sloak, the offensive coordinator, PFF Bobby, was sort of all over the place with pass rate over expected, right? One week it would be like negative six, the next week it would be plus six. And you just, you, didn't, you, didn't, you never knew what was coming. Well, over the second half of the season, they got really pass heavy. Um, they went uh, pass heavy in the second, only the Packers and Ravens had a higher drop back EPA in the second half of the season. They had the 12th highest, neutral pass rate in the second half of the season um and they were above their expected drop back rate in almost every game in the second half of the season so i think that they said hey we have this really good rookie he's proven himself let's lean on this kid and now they're bringing in digs so maybe we're going to see more passing we're going to see the the texans offense open up not be so conservative that i think that that would uh, enable all of these guys to sort of kind of get there for fantasy Kyle alluded to that, and you just made the point perfectly. And again, while you were talking, 
I, we had already kind of made this point, but I mean, Joe Mixon at this point, I would say he's not even like a real running back. He's mostly there to catch passes. He's right. there to score touchdowns. So they, they do trust him in like true short yardage situations. I mean, he's been inefficient as an early run down running back for a while now. He's kind of just like a glorified pass catcher who's really tough. He doesn't come off the field much. Um, but I thought that was a signal. Uh, and then, yeah, it's definitely – and the signal doesn't get any louder than acquiring Steph Diggs, that it's going to be a fundamentally different offense. As like you said to me, they hinted at in the second half of the season. Right. Uh, and, you know, 60% neutral pass rate in the second half. That That's strong. If we can get that up to like 63, 65, like we're cooking. Like I think that, you know, we can get there. I, I will say to answer your question, Diggs or Collins, um, I guess it depends on their ADP. I guess Diggs will go ahead of Collins, right? This is what we're assuming. Well, that's, I'm actually not assuming that. Okay. I don't know for sure. Um, but I would pro- I, I would likely prefer Collins straight up, honestly. What's it going to be, Kyle? You, I mean, you know how these, these people think, these best ball sickos <laughs> people. Like you're kind of one of them. You're in their world. You've gone undercover. Uh, <laughs> is it going to be Nico or Steph Diggs? Who, who is Patrick Crane? Currently, already somehow drafting for the fifth time today. Pretty sure Pat's drafting Nico. I, I think we'll probably take both of them. I think by the end, by August 30th, Nico is going ahead of him. We're going to get a lot of talk. And, you know, we've we made the point on this show, and it's valid talk, that uh, Stefan Diggs is coming off in totality a really down year for his efficiency stuff, let alone the fact that it was driven almost exclusively by the second half, the more recent data we have from him on a really down efficiency year. And Nico Collins, on the other hand, was second in the NFL last year in yards per route run, trailed only to, or only Tyreek Hill. He was the only other receiver over three yards per route run, I believe. So I, I think it'll end up being the younger, more efficient last year, has more experience with the team wide receiver in Nico Collins. I do think they'll go very close to each other because we've also seen Stephon Diggs come back from a down year before. I believe it was his second year in Buffalo where like mm-hmm. his, his like market share stuff was the same and he just had some drops. He wasn't breaking off as many long plays and we were saying, oh, well, it was just a one year fluke. And no, it wasn't. The very next year he had, I think, his best year in Buffalo. So not ruling out Diggs coming back to being truly elite Stephon Diggs. But I think drafters and myself included are, are going to see what happened last year. What have you done for me lately? And go with Nico. All this Texans talk, and never once did you say Robert Woods' name. Uh, well, he was on the list after Noah Brown. Our guy, so. our guy is down absolutely horrendous. <laughs> no, nah, he's a glue guy. He doesn't need the targets. He doesn't need the fame. He doesn't need the glory. He's teaching these young bucks how to get it. He's down unfathomable and probably going to be released, I would, you would think. Yeah, there's no, there's no room for him. Really quick before we move on. So say the Bills don't draft like a top 75 receiver. Is oh, Khalil my God. Shakir, is where, <laughs> Khalil Shakir, where then? Is he top 36? No. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I don't I think, think so. so. No? I, I think I think his role overlaps too much with Curtis Samuel. I do think at that point there's like a threat of him not playing a ton still, and they're like truly trotting out Mac Hollins or a fourth-round rookie or whatever. I don't, I, I, we're going to have to look into those numbers. I, I, I feel... I feel more confident in Shakir, I, I guess, than the consensus. Yikes. Wrong again. Denny's going to be on a losing streak. <laughs> After finally being on a season-long winning streak, he began with the Super Bowl. He's going to be on a losing streak this offseason. Uh, <laughs> Bills, Bills don't have their third-round pick. I think they traded it away to, was it to get Rasul Douglas, if I remember correctly? So they've got two rounds to make the moves. Otherwise, they're waiting a long time. Wow, that is going to be really interesting. It's a, a big, big year. Big, big offseason for the Buffalo Bills. Big, big show. We'll be right back to talk about coaches after this. Get your weekday started with Bet the Edge. Join Jay Croucher and Drew Densick as they break down the NFL draft, NBA, MLB, and much more. New episodes drop every weekday at 6 a.m. Eastern on the NBC Sports YouTube channel, and you can find it in podcast form wherever you download and subscribe. So whether you're looking to get involved on who will be drafted in the top 10 later this month or interested in player props and futures, check out Jay and Drew for more insight. And don't forget, find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music, just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. Starting to crumble in every promo read. <laughs> I uh, unmuted myself. So I was like, I'm ready to hop in. Then it started again. I was like, oh, hold on. Yeah. Well, words. Uh, tell you where I'm not uh, melting down or struggling for words is my coaching article. I know. And it's <laughs> very, very long. But I, it's also, it's an article you don't have to consume in totality, which is almost 7,000 words. It's kind of meant to be like a smash and grab article, like read one paragraph here. We read one paragraph there. 
Find paragraph. something you hate and scream about it. Exactly, exactly. People have united, have rallied around today my Dennis Allen ranking, where he is ranked dead last amongst the holdover coaches and has gone viral in Saints Twitter. Thanks really? to a, re- a retweet from ESPN's Catherine Terrell. She's helped my article go. And there's a one or two people are upset. It's mostly like, it's like, like this is still, you know, the class, this is still too high. <laughs> it's dead last. Um, and what, someone was complaining about it being too high without realizing that I wasn't ranking the new hires in there. Someone thought yeah. he had increased. The last year he had to rank 27 coaches. There were only five firings, and he was 26 out of 27 last year. He's 24 out of 24 this year. So he increases on a technicality. He like, did. They're like, how the, how did he increase? Like, are you joking? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, like, you, like, are you smoking? And I was like, uh, no, he actually, in real terms, decreased. Yes. He's now dead last. Out of uh, So he's dead last. Andy Reid is dead first. Sean McVay. Uh, without Bill Belichick, thank God Bill Belichick's not coaching right now, man. Uh, oh man, I wasn't. I, wasn't this ready show for that. would have been a battlefield, let alone the t- comment wasn't, section. Wasn't ready yeah. for that steam. Um, yeah, I, I we would have started cursing at each other. Oh man, we, we would have. So Reed's first, Sean McVay second, John Harbaugh's third, Kyle Shanahan's fourth. It is kind of hard to properly order those guys. Mike Tomlin's fifth. People aren't aren't really complaining about the Mike Tomlin ranks anymore. At least it was you got this guy way too high. He's like, they lose every playoffs, blah, blah, blah. And then now, since he keeps making the playoffs without a real quarterback, they're like, okay, yeah, it's actually pretty good. And it people be, like the ball nose something. ranking. It's a classic ball yeah. nose ranking. People like Mike Tomlin now. That's where it got really hard because no Belichick, no Mike Vrabel, no <clears throat> Pete Carroll used to kind of all check in in like this weird, like six to 12 nether range. But now it's six. It's Matt LaFleur. Then it's Dan Campbell, did a leap of faith there. Sean McDermott is eight. Zach Taylor at nine, Kevin Stefanski at 10. You can find the whole rankings uh, in the article. But Denny, we'll start with you. And we're going to ask you, who is someone do you think I have ranked too low? Uh, someone too low. I, I do think that Campbell is a little too low here at seven. I know you said it's a, 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 who could it be ahead of? I know it's you said it's a leap of faith, but I I love our analytics king Dan Campbell. He's had he's had one winning season in, in three years though, and oh, I, I would argue seven is very oh, high actually, very very high. Uh, all right, <clears throat> I would rank him above Lafleur. Uh, rank him that, above someone. Lafleur Lafleur has accomplished an important concept: the the second quarterback transition. Like almost everyone on this list in the top yeah. has survived a quarterback transition. I was very shaky of Matt LaFleur last year because I was like, all right, Aaron Rodgers had one down year and all of a sudden they're not good. I have no idea if Matt LaFleur is actually good. Uh, but now he rebounds with the new quarterback this year. Surviving a quarterback transition and still like remaining a winning team yeah. is a huge, huge accomplishment. I, I like LaFleur and I'm a, I'm a big Jordan Love guy. Always have been. Okay. Even when <laughs> it was not popular, I've always been a Jordan Love guy. So, so I, I, I see the argument there. I'm not saying that seven is egregious for. Campbell I'm saying I will try to get him near that top five I can't really I don't think I can put him over Tomlin but it's I think it's very close because I'm mean, Dan Campbell look I actually don't think that the Lions are as good as they seemed last year I think that that through like grit and a mix like a mix of grit and analytics Dan Campbell like forced them like willed them into the playoffs and de- and and almost to the Super Bowl you know like it I I really I- extremely impressed with his ability to do what it takes and and also his rejection of NFL coaching norms, a total rejection. I've never seen a coach do, do that at to the extreme that he does. It, okay. He's taken it all the way to the extreme and people hate him, hate him for it. They freak out the, uh, the old state media types. They hate Dan Campbell for messing up the, the game. And the game is you, you lose in a certain way and you win in a certain way. And he says, no, we're, we're only going to try to win. And that's what he did last year. Obviously, going for fourth down multiple times in the uh, NFC title game. I t- I wanted to get Dan Campbell as high as possible. I just thought seven was as high as possible. Basically, it is high. I, and I'm the people I'm in front saying, of him. The track records are just too yeah, long. They're I, too right. long. I, I'm definitely not saying that you're way off. You're not way off. Okay. In fact, I mean, I was when I clicked it open. I, I opened the article at first. I thought it was he was going to be outside the top ten, and I was going to have a heart attack. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so s- seven's fine. I would. Maybe get him into the top five. The who over who? Like okay, I, I, so, okay. I say, say I put him over the floor, and then he's six. And then you Tomlin, you put him out of you put him out of Mike Tomlin, who 
in 17 years has literally never finished below 500. I know. And, um, <laughs> has a 633 winning percentage or nearly two decades of being a head coach. I know, you really think and- Dan Campbell's proven more than Mike Tomlin? Well, okay, but I, I, I guess I'm maybe I'm confused about uh, what you're doing with the ranks because if Belichick was still coaching, he'd be number one, right? No, he wasn't last year. Andy Reid had finally leapfrogged him. It, it's, it's not only a career retrospective; it is heavily weighted. But recent okay. history, it's the, the main criteria is overall career, of course, and then kind of a rolling two or three year average for how they've been doing recently, essentially. So that's okay. why I finally bumped Belichick out of the top spot last year. Cause like there was, there was no way even you couldn't debate that over the past three years, like Andy Reid, who was never even that far behind him had had a better three years. So that, that was the criteria for finally dropping Belichick out of the top last year. And then this year after the fiasco, that was the 2023 Pat season, I would have probably had a disclaimer. Like, listen, I think Bill Belichick honestly is the best coach in NFL history, but right now these five or six guys are just clearly doing a better job. And I still would have had him in like the six to seven range. Um, But so it, but you have to, you have to give track. So like every year you kind of have to make like these, like on these small sample size judgment calls. Like last year I had Nick Sirianni eight and you get, you get humbled every year. Like, yep, that's why you don't put someone in the top 10 immediately because they just might actually be bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like coach of the year award is always like, Oh, what did this guy do for me this past year? Whereas like coach of the year should have been Andy Reid for five years. And then Bill Belichick for like the previous five years. That's coming to someone who like, I, you know, I've kind of poo-pooed Bill Belichick, and I'm still like, yeah, he should have been coach of the year like every year for a decade, and then Andy Reid should have just won it for the next five. Once Belichick fall off, just give it to Andy. Maybe throw one to like Shaney's way when he got there with Jimmy or whatever. But like, there are clearly three to four coaches who are the best coach of the year, and then there are coaches who surprise us, who excite us, who exceed expectations. It doesn't make them the best coach of the year. And I do think part of determining who is good, just like in, in the real NFL, like Stephon Diggs was not particularly good last year. He was like, in terms of a lot of the advanced metrics, like the 36th best receiver or whatever. Do I think he's actually the 36th best receiver in the NFL? I think he's way better than that. I still think after last year, he's probably one of the 15 or so best receivers because I'm waiting his prior seasons, you know, not as heavily as I'm waiting his most recent season, but I care. And I think uh, that's, that's probably where a lot of the, Tomlin getting there. Pat, when do you think the last time Tomlin won a, a playoff game was? Mm, I think it was like 2013. Oh, well, you actually, you undershot it. Uh, <laughs> I think he won one in 2016. I, I have a pulled right. up. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, like, like, as I mentioned earlier, John Harbaugh, since they won the Super Bowl, has three playoff victories in 11 years, which is another way I just get to, like, I, I say John Harbaugh, he, he's basically lived long enough to become unlucky. And like, <laughs> even like the same thing with Mike McCarthy, like everyone, he was just, one Everyone just, we'll talk about Mike McCarthy. Everyone remembers, of course, the annual January losses. But as we also know, there's two possible endings to every single season. And you could be an elite head coach and just keep getting unlucky or keep drawing a bad, like having a bad matchup in the playoffs. And it just doesn't matter. Those are some of the guys I actually thought you were too low on were my examples. Who's someone I'm too low on, Kyle? McCarthy was one of mine, actually. He's he's that type of guy. I think he's he's not Tomlin, right? But the argument you make for Tomlin top five, I'm making a smaller argument for McCarthy, where we've seen success with multiple quarterbacks on multiple different teams. We've all seen fail- failures with different teams as well, with, with one team specifically. But in the regular season, the Cowboys are consistently a damn good football team. If you look at, if you were just to scramble their games up and pick one out of a hat, and you did that a bunch of times, you would always say, this is a really good football team. Last year, I think they were second in EPA per play. Dak Prescott was in the MVP race at the end of the season. I believe he led the league in passing touchdowns, was top five in passing yards. And they adapted better than we gave McCarthy a lot of credit for because the let's make Tony Pollard the bell cow completely flopped. Like, okay, well, I guess we just let CD go for 1,700 yards and score a bunch of points, which is something we didn't think they could, they would be willing to do. Not that they couldn't do. We didn't think they'd be flexible enough to just say, we have a quarterback who's a top six guy in the NFL. You know, he's in that conversation at least. Let's let him sling it. And they did that. And then you get the annual January loss and the, the, sort of uh, all the accolades go out the window. I I tend to think that, yes, there are definitely coaches who, and teams who, as they face better competition, which is what the playoffs are, right? As you face better competition, you'll get worse or the pressure just gets to them and they get worse. But I don't want to wait like three games because McCarthy, you know, it's like three or four January losses at this point. I don't want to wait those three or four games too much to throw out that like 
some teams just lose three or four of the games you really don't want to lose. And maybe this isn't one of those teams, but there's a good team in the regular season. I think if you run it back long enough, you'll find yourself a good team in the postseason. It, it is so weird with McCarthy because all the elite coaches on this list have lost like some of the biggest games of their life. Like Andy yeah. Reid had lost every biggest game of his life. Yeah. Until he had Patrick Mahomes. Uh, kind of the same thing for same thing for Kyle Shanahan right now. It just seemed like Mike McCarthy uh, fundamentally always loses. The <laughs> he did win a Super Bowl. It, McCarthy, as I say, it's basically it, it's become so hard to disentangle like where the McCarthy narrative ends and like the real McCarthy begins. That I don't know if we can like ever get proper perspective on him at this point. Cause it was just like clockwork. I mean, they had such a good season and they're not even barely even competitive in the wild card. I, I credit yeah. I credit McCarthy for you know, booting Kellen Moore and being like, I'm the captain now. Like, we're, we're going to actually score points now. We're going to have a modern NFL offense now. And and he was right. Like, like we were all wrong. I, I continually apologize for this. We were all wrong about Kellen Moore, the fakest sharp in the NFL. We were all wrong about McCarthy, who, who still desperately wants to score points, despite his talk about establishing the run and playing defense and all that nonsense. He, he really does truly want to score points. Actions speak louder than words, this and that. So <clears throat> I th- I think last year was actually really great for McCarthy, but I know it didn't end in the Super Bowl, so it doesn't matter. Pat, I believe it's 16. Is it, it's either 14, no, four, 14, 14. 14. Oh, sorry, 14. I'll say with this with McCarthy, this doesn't support having him at 14. This would be like, well, yeah, you should still have him higher if this, you feel this way. But he, he's almost in some ways like the Peyton Manning of coaches where he's one of the best ever front runners. Like he's kind of like a almost like Mike McDaniel, where it's like a hacker of the game, where it's not really like an overly complicated offense. You found like my other do, guy that I want. They to do the up. same three or four things super well, like over and over and over and over again. Some people would say the slants they did too well in Green Bay and became way too reliant on slants. Yeah, wow. in Green Bay, but like it's like the second the hacking stops working, they have no counter punch whatsoever. And it's not like every playoff, Mike McCarthy has like no counter punch. And that happened to Peyton Manning so often. Or like he, he was like the ultimate game hacker. But like if, if things went awry though, then he's like, well, I'm screwed. And it's some kind of how Mike McCarthy is his coach, but he's the most polarizing guy on the list. But he's, he's like impossible to properly rank. I'll say that about Mike McCarthy. Uh, we'll, we'll get to more of your guys. Uh, but Denny, who's, uh, who's someone I got too high. Who's someone I got too high. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's going to go with a couple guys here, but I'll, I'll stick with uh, Sean McDermott. Um, I think, Inside the top 10 is too high for Sean McDermott. Sean McDermott. Um, <clears throat> not that he, I don't think that he should be outside the top half, but top eight, number eight, you have a, a, a number eight just uh, below Dan Campbell and just above Kevin Stefanski. No, Zach Taylor. Zach Taylor at nine. Um, I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I feel like Sean McDermott, like Dan Campbell doing a lot with a little in Detroit. I feel like it's the complete opposite with McDermott and Buffalo. He's done so little with so much. <laughs> And, and, and like you said, like you pointed out, he's in his own head, constantly finding ways to like choke away huge games, constantly making uh, suboptimal decisions as far as clock management, as far as going for it on cru- crucial fourth down. You know, I, I, I do feel like he is the ultimate, uh, we're not going to lose coach. You know, we might not win, but we're not going to lose this he game. He hates to lose. Um, well, no, what, what I mean is, is he plays? No, I know, I know, yeah. I know exactly. I've said he doesn't yeah, make yeah. decisions based on trying to win. He's just trying desperately not to lose. He's hoping and praying that the other team makes the mistake and instead of him seizing the opportunity and, and actually going through with it. And he happens to have one of the best, uh, you know, quarterbacks in modern NFL history. So, what is he doing? I feel like he, he is does. under. He has the best quarterback in modern NFL history who is liable to make a game-ending mistake on any given play in the fourth yeah. quarter. I'll say about Josh Allen. <laughs> and one of the big points in Sean McDermott's favor is you say he, you say he hasn't done a lot, or he's doing a little with a lot. I think a lot of people would say on defense, he does a lot with a little. Yeah. They have good defensive person. Right. He's, right. he's clearly one of the best, like, scheme him up defensive coaches and, in the and this is but this is the problem with 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 promoting defensive coaches to head coach right yeah, it, yeah. i mean it, it it doesn't always happen we're seeing with D'Amico ryan D'Amico ryan's modern dude like he's like yes obviously we have to score points we're going to surround cj stroud with all the weapons that we can handle he can handle and that's great so D'Amico ryan's gets it 
But for every D'Amico Ryan's, there's a Sean, there are 15 Sean McDermott's, right? Let's be clear. We don't know if D'Amico Ryan's gets it either. I think he gets it. I, I, I mean, mean we'll, we'll get into that. He in a gets the delegating of it. He's like, yeah, go, go yes, run a good right. offense, Bobby. So he delegates the but offense. Bobby didn't run a great offense. Well, I, I know, I know. I don't want to get bogged down with the Texans. I, but I, I, I just want to say. I'm with any of the Texans in this. I think they figured it out in the second half of the season. Which, ex- with a few extremely notable exceptions, including that like week 16 or 17 where like they had to win and they did not throw. I can't remember who it was against. It was against the Patriots. That game really, or, really stuck no. in my memory. I'm for, sorry. Like, the the slow Stroud. Like, ah, oh, man, uh, you did everything humanly possible to oh. lose this game. I think they won like 10 to 7 or something it w- nuts. Uh, Yeah. Uh, it was the Titans, 19 Titans. to 16. Titans. They, they just they, like did not throw the football. And, yeah, and they, they didn't throw against the, the Colts either in week 18. The, against the Titans, they dropped back 52% of their plays, which is really bad. Really, really quite bad. CJ um, Stroud in the must win week 18 and 26 attempts. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. They got scared. They they got and it, it's a young team. They're scared. They I do think that the Texans last year they struck me as a team that was afraid of their success. You know, what, they were. what are we what are we doing? We're supposed to be a bottom feeder. We're competing for a postseason spot. This was not supposed to happen. It freaks some teams out. You know, I think that they're they're kind of getting their heads around it. Oh, wait, we're good. After decade a decade of of incompetence, we're actually good. Um, but anyway, I'm excusing the me. Titans one. I'm excusing the Titans one. The the Jags did this last year too, where they played like I think it was Josh Dobbs. They played against Josh Dobbs and they just gave up on passing. It's like you can't score three points, and right. their opponent didn't. And in this game, the Titans scored three points. So so McDermott <laughs> We're so bogged down. Say what were we ahead, talking Danny. about? So yeah, no, McDermott at number eight. I, so I, I I think McDermott would be could be a top flight defensive coordinator in the league. Like, uh, like I'm talking like Spagnola level. Okay. No, he, he exceeds that. I I've seen Steve Spagnola as a head coach. No, Like, I know what you mean that he's an elite defensive coordinator. who's probably a little stretched, a little thin as a head coach, but you don't win 10 plus games, five straight. You don't win at least one playoff game, four straight years without being at least kind of a good. I I don't know, man, but I feel like, like despite all those wins, I feel like that's still underachieving for the team. Well, that they it's have. underachieving, and it's also the league. I wrote this somewhere in the article. Sometimes the league just segues from Tom Brady to Patrick Mahomes. Sean, Sean McDermott has overlapped with the AFC passing the torch from Tom Brady to Pat, two of like the literally century defining players in the NFL. I yeah, what I'm, Sean I'm McDermott kind of, is going up against. I'm kind of with Denny on I'm a little bit lower on Sean McDermott as well, but that, that's a really fair point is that if this team plays in the NFC, if this Buffalo Bills team plays in the NFC for the past five years, they probably at least have four Super Bowl losses to Patrick Mahomes instead of, you know, instead of four <laughs> AFC championship, divisional, whatever it may be. Denny, who was someone else you want to talk about? Who cares about highest or lowest? There were two yeah. coaches I know that you really wanted to talk yeah, about. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, I do want to just shout out your your funny Mike McDaniel uh, blurb here where you said uh, McDaniel has reached his Garoppolo, Garoppolo maximum. I said, uh, has he? Or, that's what we're wondering. If he's I'm reached sorry, his Garoppolo has, maximum. Right, I'm sorry, you're right. I completely botched that sentence. Has McDaniel already reached his Garoppolo maximum? With Tua, can the offense be a little more resilient uh, McDaniel's attack is thwarted by seemingly simple adjustments by savvy defensive minds a little too often. Uh, and yeah, and then the stretch last year at the end of the season was really bleak, really bleak. Like they couldn't do the one thing that they do, which is to throw over the middle quickly. And then uh, Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle get a bunch of yards after the kids. They couldn't do that because de- defenses were like, no, we're not going to let you do that. And they had nothing else. They had no other answers. And like it, as I say in the write-up, it's cool. It's a skill to be able to do that. It's a skill to be able to hack either Madden or the real-life NFL. You figure right. out the two or three things the computer can't stop, quote-unquote. Yeah. And if you do that over and over, there's no reason not to do it until someone does stop it. And the better teams do stop it. And that's when you have to have the counterpunch. Two years in a row, he has not had the counterpunch, Mike McDaniel. So it, it's an amazing first step that he's capable of the hacking the game to begin with. So that, that sets an amazing baseline make ceiling possible it's a positive it by no means is it a negative it's just his reality like okay he's got this really cool baseline figured out like very few people can do this that's amazing but now to take like the next step he has to take the next step and adjust to the adjustments and he has not done that yet i also i i do think um that that this dolphins offense well it's, it's not as pass heavy as as i had assumed um you know by the end of the season i looked at season long numbers and you know we're talking about a miami offense that was only two percent above its expected drop back rate it was one of the 
run heavier units when when holding a lead, right? So they they really took the air out of the ball when holding the lead. I I I think I feel like that shows a lack of confidence in the quarterback. And so you guys just reminded me of a point with Mike McCarthy because we're talking on air. I said, man, I don't know. why am I ranking him 14th? And I'm going through my list and I'm remembering why I'm ranking him 14th. And I say it's a combination of like, like career and recent history type stuff. It's also just like most of these guys where I'm giving like kind of like career based rankings, I think are still this like elite current head coach. Like I still think like I'm starting a franchise today. I would happily have Mike Tomlin as my head coach. But yeah, we're like starting the NFL over at zero. There's like an expansion draft. There's no way in hell I'm hiring Mike McCarthy over Mike McDaniel, over Kevin O'Connell, even after, over Sean Payton, who's another guy now where we don't really know how good he still is. We, we know that at one time he was elite, but we don't truly know how good he is right now. Like McCarthy is perfectly fine. A lot of experience. He's got an okay system, but like, so and he knows what to do when he's a good quarterback, which a lot of coaches don't even know what to do when they have a good quarterback. But like if we're jumbling and resetting the league, I'm like, yeah, oh man, there's at least twelve or thirteen guys I'm taking over Mike McCarthy. That's kind of what it comes down to with Mike. McCarthy. Yeah, I, I like I like that criteria a lot. Um, I, I feel like I would take Mike McDaniel higher probably, but it's just it's just the I say this in the Nick yeah, Sirianni I, thing. Yeah, I, know, mm-hmm. I know you got to be careful. How reverently you worship at the altar of coach. I right. wrote for, for it, it's two years. It's two yeah. years where they have exceeded expectations. We're like, let's not go crazy over two 10 and seven campaigns. And you know, I, I, you know what the funny thing is with the Dolphins, with the current Dolphins, is they're the same sort of team that I grew up watching as a Dolphins fan. A just finesse, crushing, just, just finesse, yeah. crushing people in September and October, just humiliating the entire league establishing themselves as Super Bowl favorites every year, and then a total collapse once the temperature drops below 50. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really just bad. the same thing every year. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, Kyle, who is the next coach you want to talk about? Was it too high, too low, too perfect? Uh, I actually – I had McDaniel, too. I'll throw, I'll throw. <laughs> uh, Too perfect. Andy Reid, he's my number one, too, so you nailed that one. Uh, I, I had I'll, – I'll just throw in my two cents on McDaniel is that uh, – I feel like you, if, and I, I, we're all of varying degrees of this opinion, we really don't think Tua is that special of a quarterback. I think he's fine. I think this version of the Dolphins, like if he was on a rookie contract forever over a long period of time, could probably win a Super Bowl. Like they could get lucky and find some teams they can beat in the playoffs and have break a few long Tyreek games. But like, if we're being honest, I think Tua is just fine. I don't think he's one of the best dozen quarterbacks in the NFL. I don't know. He's probably one of the best 16. And I don't know if you guys would even say that, right? Like, yeah, probably. right. He, he's right there. He's in the mix. He's in the top 16. Mix. And yeah. to make him look like the best quarterback in the NFL and all of my spreadsheets. For a while. To, I mean, this, it, the spreadsheets probably weren't even that kind in the second half of the season. No, they, no, no, no sure. If you bad. only look at the bad games, he doesn't look very good. But, but like, My favorite Simpsons school, well, everything looks bad if you remember it. <laughs> 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 uh yeah i don't sorry i sidetracked you didn't make any sense but yeah they were uh they were fourth in the nfl in epa per play they were third in pass epa per play on the year obviously like the, and the second half of the year was the worst half of the year and it's they, also- they literally stopped scoring he literally stopped throwing touchdowns like ever to a, he was carrying my teams for two months <laughs> and he just didn't throw touchdowns the second half of the season yeah yeah but think about the first half though what if and the I first half had been the second half? personally responsible Mike McDaniel, is, he's he's got a cool trick. Like I'm not even saying like dismissively, like or derisively. Like he's got a really cool trick. It's set an amazing baseline. Yeah. But I think we've already seen the limits. Like, all right, we we need step two now. Yeah, yeah. So who who do you think it is being limited right now? My point about Tua is yeah, that no, no, I it's don't... true. But it's also it's it's that we can only infer so much. You, I agree. You, I agree. We don't know still. what this team would look like with a Joe Burrow. Uh, like we just, we know what we know. We know that with a quarterback who I think is one of the best 16 is, is, is almost certainly one of the best 20 quarterbacks in the NFL, but I don't think is one of the best dozen. We know that they can build a like juggernaut offense that also falters without like, without a good counterpunch, right? That is, we do not see that from many other coaches in the NFL. We do not see coaches turn the, let's call him the 16th best quarterback. We do not see them turn that guy even to just a bad team slayer. We do not see that very often. 
So I'm going to give him a lot of credit for that. If I want to, I gave him right. a guy who's never won a playoff game. I say he's the 11th best coach in the NFL. Yeah, so that is high for, I'd for say I'm giving him credit. Yeah. Considering yeah, I, that there's only 26 coaches game. ranked, though. So that's like just a little above average. As I am contractually required to say every single show, like, I've never seen a playoff game more lost for the first snap. <laughs> than the it Dolphins was cold. What are you going to do? It was cold. It was very, very cold. It was very, very cold. <laughs> we actually have a little more coach chatter, but we'll be right back after this. Cap off Premier League Fan Fest in Nashville this weekend by watching a thrilling matchup on Sunday as Mo Salah and Liverpool look to stay atop the table as they take on Manchester United. Kick is set for 10.30 a.m. Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. Now, I kind of like lost track of our organizing principles for this debate. Uh, but, Denny, I know you wanted to talk about Doug Peterson. This yeah. is a good one to lose track and just let loose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So you have you have Peterson ranked 16, which I think is perfectly fine. He's 60, 53 and 1 on his career. That's a 53 53% uh career winning percentage. You know, he's entering his third year, third year with the Jags. Um and outside of that miracle playoff win against Outside Jags, of facing Brandon Staley once. I, there's, just, there's just there's not much going on there's just not much going on I, I i i feel like he kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit last off season when they asked him about trevor lawrence and he he talked about him like a developing quarterback like yeah we we still got to develop him we got to get him get him right in this area and that area and stuff and i mean he was entering his third pro season now i know urban meyer i get i know i remember urban meyer i'm old enough to remember that, okay <laughs> And maybe, maybe, or in the end, Urban Meyer set back Trevor Lawrence in a way that he can never recover. From. It's actually very possible. Yeah, it, right. I mean, it, it like it might be actually miraculous that Trevor Lawrence is as good as he is after going through what he went through with Urban Meyer. Yep. Okay. I'm lucky to be alive. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, he's lucky maybe to be a starter still. You know, it, it, like not to totally mentally collapse after that disaster. Um, but. But yeah, this is just a this is just a man like a a man organization with with Doug Peterson. Like what like what are they what are they good at? What what is it you do around here exactly? Is what I would ask the Doug Peterson well, coach Jaguars. Denny, it's I feel like you put it perfectly. It's how I tried to put it in my Peterson write up, where where I basically say, long story short, I say maybe he's just unlucky. Uh, variance is something he embraces with his devotion yeah. to analytics and EPA based mm -hmm. decision making which we love. And I say it's a trick few coaches embrace, but perhaps the question should be, is it Peterson's only trick? Like what else makes him special? Like it's very cool that he's one of the few coaches to truly go with EPA based decision-making. And like, it's a good thing to be good at. Uh, it can't be the only thing you're good at. And we, we're, we're, I think we're having serious questions about like his offensive design and deployment where we have a whole year, the entire league's like, yeah, maybe she used Calvin Ridley a little different. We're, we're uh, begging, like everybody, like <laughs> yeah, like Jaguars fans, pundits, <laughs> fantasy bros. We're all begging, please, please stop using Calvin Ridley this way. Calvin Ridley saying, please stop. Dan Orlovsky just in tears on ESPN every morning. Like, right, <laughs> right, uh, like yeah, weeping. Uh, you know, poor Dan, and and uh, that and that was and 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 yet they didn't change at all. Uh, I I do I do think that there's some stubbornness there, probably. Um, you know, they, they use Travis Etienne as a workhorse last year. That didn't work. I mean, yeah. Travis Etienne is not a workhorse back, whatever he is. He's not. There. What is so, Travis Etienne? Uh, we, well, we don't, we don't know. We have to look more strongly into it. I have no idea what Travis Etienne is. Maybe he's a receiver. I, I, I really have no clue. Urban but Meyer drafted him because they basically thought he was a receiver. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and well, he drafted him because he couldn't get Kadarius Tony. I was going to say, it couldn't get Kadarius Tony once. And, and and also ETN didn't catch any passes in college. <laughs> so <laughs> what was he talking about? I didn't know. We people will be working to unpack that one for a really, really, really long time. Uh, what what? So one thing we wanted to ask you guys, I'll ask you for any closing thoughts on any of the veteran head coaches, so to speak. But who do you think is the the out of the group of eight? Who is a new hire? Do you think which which of the new hires do you like? It doesn't have to be a first timer either. Which fit are you most excited about amongst the new, the eight new head coaches this offseason? Denny Carter, you go. First. No, Kyle, you go first. No, go go first, Denny. I was in the middle of uh, a Todd Bowles uh, diversion okay. on my we'll own. Do, we'll close with Todd. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Look, as much as as much as Jim Harbaugh, thank you, thank you, is not going to 
coach the way I like to see coaches coach. Um, the complete he'll do the complete opposite. Um, <clears throat> he is obviously bound and determined to make a tough nosed, run first, good defensive team, and that's what he's going to do. And the Chargers are going to be way are going to be so much better for it. Um, and they're going to they're going. I this is what I'm saying right now. They're making the postseason this year. Um, they're getting the most out of Justin Herbert, I guess, because they're going to keep him, I, I suppose. And, um, <laughs> and and I think Harbaugh, Harbaugh is in position to really establish a culture where there is none, uh, and there never has been one. There's not um, a fan base, so that is a problem. But yeah, well, yeah, it, but and and um, it, the way he talks about what he wants to do with that team makes me think, okay, well, they're just they're going to be good. There's just no two ways about it. There's no two ways about it. Small sample size, four seasons. Who is currently fifth all time in career winning percentage amongst NFL head coaches? It is Jim Harbaugh. Where my to quote myself, I said Jim Harbaugh breaks all the rules. This is sometimes a little too literally. He keeps getting suspended. But <laughs> yeah. all the rules about modern football, like passing efficiency, blah, blah, not that he has inefficient passing offenses, but he's gonna be run based, he's gonna be defensive based, he's gonna be fundamentals based, he's gonna be like toughness based, which of course people aren't gonna say any of that's bad, but like where some people view them as like night, like nice to haves. They're like the bedrock of how Jim Harbaugh coaches and how it, Oh, it worked at the university of San Diego. It worked at Stanford. It worked with the 49ers. It worked with Michigan. It just seems very hard to believe it won't work with the chargers. He has kind of never stopped innovating. He's really good with his coaching staff too, where he he's, he's like not married to like his guys, like the way Bill Belichick, he's all like John Harbaugh. They're really swapping coaches. You know, Mike McDonald has worked for both Harbaugh brothers. There's just nothing to me that suggests like Jim Harbaugh is like, he's always been out of step with modern times. There's nothing that suggests to me he's like out of step, in like a new or concerning way. He's just Jim Harbaugh, one of the most unique coaches ever. And he's still winning. And yeah, I, I don't think he could have made a better hire. So i except for maybe uh, William Belichick, but um, uh, I digress. Um, how, how I'm, I'm starting to get, I'm starting to get peaked about, about Harbaugh. Like, he is really just diving into this Nepo Ravens hire thing. Uh, and he's not getting the good ones either. Like he That's true. He did get his guy. He got his guy, Gregory. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you said like, treated he's not very, unfair. To his... very unfair. Very unfair. Mm, I don't know. They're doing Lamar... to Greg Roman. <laughs> very unfair. My last memory of Greg Roman was Lamar telling the press that the other team knew the plays they were gonna run. Uh, under Greg Roman, obviously, uh, they bring in Gus Edwards. They bring in uh, the fullback from Baltimore. I think Ben Mason. He's like on their practice squad. Like, I don't know, man. I, I think he does have his guys. I mean, the Roman thing is very clear indication that he has his guys. And he is a guy. He he's always had unique, co varied coaching staffs. I would say. He but it's guys. just a guy who coached under his brother. Like that's just it's, well, coached under coach Jim under first. You may have uh, the Zoomer may be forgetting that Greg Roman. Spent a long time with Jim Harbaugh in San Francisco. Kyle. You know, I know that was uh, the Kaepernick, Kaepernick. at least one of those years with Kaepernick. But I'm saying like they also, you know, they traded back and forth Mike McDonald as well. McDonald was the Ravens and he was Michigan. And yeah, and everyone Ravens. loves him. He's the youngest head coach in the NFL. What's the problem? Yeah, actually, I like that hire better, I think. Um, so what's the, the freaking problem? I'm, I'm, man, hire a good Raven once. That's all we need. Like <laughs> who? They don't exist. No, There's God, the Ravens had to, Clowney get Clowney. That would have been a great one. Get to Davian no, Clowney. They can't, they can't afford to Davian Clowney at the side. No, they have no Hill. need for my Tom Telesco they left them in. Uh, no, uh, can I, can, uh, just say something about what Adam Schefter just reported about Stefan Diggs. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Let's hear it. yeah. Uh, Schefter reports that the Texans have removed the final three years of Diggs's contract so that he'll be a, a free agent after this season. So there, there's no commitment there to, to Diggs as a uh, long term. It's Either be an extreme motivating factor, factor, or an extreme like I didn't even know. Motivating. They say I didn't even know this emoji existed. Where yeah. did he? <laughs> and why is he tweeting it every hour? It seems very menacing. He didn't put it on tweet deck either, though. He has to do it by hand. It's just like it's like some weird like coconut emoji. Like I don't really know what that means. It seems right. kind of ominous, though. <laughs> what, what did you want to say about Todd Bowles? That was a hard one. Todd Bowles are this, this guy is very hard, very hard. Uh, nobody knows more about it than me. 
Uh, it didn't. It hardly even mattered. Denny said, "What do you even do here about someone else?" I was like, "Ah, oh, it's Todd Bowles. That's actually that's." No, well, I wish it were true, but it's not. He yeah, really yeah, does consistently know. scheme up good defenses. I mean, they were like a below average defense in EPA last year. I, who cares about EPA and like real point in terms of real points? They were like top five or six guys. There's no he, way they were a top. They five were. They were seven. Balls, I yeah. actually knew they were seven because I cited it in the article. Um, but he flipped on the. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't have a computer. So yeah, I mean, like I guess if you're going to play EPA. Bryce Young, Derek Carr, uh, Desmond Ritter a bunch of times, you're going to look pretty good. Yeah, well, hey, Congrats listen, on getting one of the things I always say about players, but it's true for coaches, what's the first thing a good player does? It's do really well against the bad teams and bad players. So Todd Bowles did that. I bet you, I bet you thought you were real smart when you said that. Well, <laughs> then get Mike McDaniel to hire. He kills the bad teams. He crushes I, I, I mean, I, I have to give Bowles credit for – Handing handing over the offensive reins last year to Dave Canales exactly. and saying like go sure. do your thing for that. And um, he made another like outside hire, Liam Cohen, like a really guy with a fascinating background, McVay yeah. connections. Although he seemed like he didn't like working with McVay. So I mean, yeah, we're like talking. I mean, like any defensive guy who's who's willing to step away from the offense is is my kind of guy. That's the that's the right way to go. Yeah, sure. they brought in. I think at least one of the big reasons bringing Cohen was he was there for the Baker Mayfield stretch in uh, L.A. a LA, year ago yeah. or two well, years ago. California. Now. Yeah, um, yeah, he's not like he wasn't terrible. Pat, you should rank the the new hires. I think it'd be fun to rank the new hires. It'd be too hard. It, it actually would be too hard. I, mean, I don't know. You seem to have a pretty easy time putting Harbaugh at one because then, like, mm. no matter what, it'd be some guy who never coached before, and then be thirty second. Like, why do you think this is such a bad hire? You friggin' idiot. I think I think you should rank them within each other. Don't you know? Start over. Don't even start it. Don't go to twenty seven. Start over at one, two, three. Uh, I, we I, mentioned... Hey, I do. I rank the new hires by the alphabet. <laughs> uh, Canales came in at number two in the alphabet, so actually, it would have it would have aligned with. <laughs> he did. I, I, I maybe would have him number one. I think he was a really strong you hire. Know, he came in last in the alphabet with the letter Q. Dan. Yeah, Dan. <laughs> so, <laughs> Would have come that, in that might dead be, last. Uh, yeah. That might be analytics. We had to look into Anybody that. else that you wanted to talk about before we get out of here? No, I liked Canales. I think you got to take a shot on a quarterback redeeming coach, uh, even if it's a long shot. Like I think the most likely outcome is this doesn't work, given how bad Bryce was last year, and given that we don't like we don't know. I, I guess like the average NFL hire at head coach probably doesn't work. We see so much churn at the at the head coach position, but you have to take. A, a long shot at this point, given the way the franchise is structured, tied to Bryce Young for probably another, like, if it's really bad, I guess you can move on from him in a year. But they've also gave up so much draft capital to get him that they're depleted in, like, the influx of youth talent they have as well. And they weren't, like, flush, flush with tap to add other talent. So they need a Bryce Young fixer. And if any, you know, potential hire was going to be it, I think Canales is probably the best bet at that. So I think they took a shot. I think the average outcome is that it just doesn't work because it's hard to make things work in the NFL, especially from what we saw from Bryce last year. But that I think they're doing their best, and Canales was a good step in that direction. Not a single person yelled at me about Nick Sirianni, by the way. Probably not a great sign for our guy. Yeah. Uh, he's a, Is he 16 or something like that, He right? was 15, yeah. 15, yeah. That's... It's crazy. That's actually how you know the ranking is good, if not maybe a little too de- generous. Is everyone's like, "Oh, you, thanks for getting us that one." <laughs> Denny knows Giants fans get mad like every single like a dude. I have him ranked number one. Like, what are you mad yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> like, they no one has said a word about Brian Dable being twentieth either. Uh, one spot ahead of Robert Sala. Our, our New York guys need some help in twenty. I, I actually think that Dable is just dragged down so so hard by Daniel Jones. I I think that he's probably a good I coach. But you know. I do, but I also think. People need to go on Brian Dable's Wikipedia a little more and see uh, yeah, how many right. different times he failed before he met a man by the yeah. name of Josh Allen. He has, he has failed in almost every place. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so so uh, we will not fail at ending the show at the appropriate moment. It's time to go. I really appreciate you guys talking about the article. Really appreciate Kyle getting up an article on the fod of the Steph Diggs trade. You can check that out at roadworld.com. We appreciate Denny probably does we know and love him very very much i made a video i made a one <laughs> was just saying it's just nice. weird uh, denny all has an article every single week and says we we don't know what to do when you don't have an article <laughs> no, we don't know what to do um so for denny carter for kyle devorchik i'm patrick darty thank you so much for listening we'll be back next week